Michael Azarad is an esteemed music journalist and author based in New York City. A one-time contributing editor at Rolling Stone, where he wrote their first extensive cover story about Nirvana, and subsequently was a contributor to Spin, The New York Times, and The New Yorker, among many others, Azarad is particularly renowned for having written two monumental music books, 1993's Come As You Are, The Story of Nirvana, and 2001's Our Band Could Be Your Life, Scenes from the American Indie Underground, 1981-1991. to After a stint as editor-in-chief of the online magazine and popular podcast The Talk House, and creating a hashtag that amused many people on Twitter, Azarad set to work on his new book, Rock Critic Law, 101 Unbreakable Rules for Writing Badly About Music, which features illustrations by Seattle's Edwin Fotheringham and was published by HarperCollins. Michael and I connected recently for a conversation about rock critic law, the state of music criticism and rock music, how deadline-driven content might lead to a uh, cliché-laden writing style, whether or not rock music might just be kind of boring to write about nowadays, why the meaning of words and language doesn't seem to matter to people as much as it likely should, his future plans, and much more. With the support of listeners like you, who subscribe to this podcast and spread the word about it, and make flexible monthly pledges at patreon.com slash creativecontrol, plus in-kind support from Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton, this is the 436th episode of Creative Control, featuring the influential and brilliant writer Michael Azarad, with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Hi, Michael. How are you? I'm great, Vish. How are you? I'm very well. It's nice to speak with you again. Uh, we were just talking uh, just before we started here about how the last time we were in the same place, in the same room, was in Oslo, Norway. A fine, fascinating town it was, <laughs> full of rock and roll, apparently. I believe that was almost exactly 10 years ago. I feel like that might be true. So this I is, think that's exactly... Yeah. yeah. It, was, it was towards the end of the year. I remember that. Yeah. So this is like an anniversary for us yeah uh, of some Great. kind yeah so it's nice to uh, chat with you again and and uh, lo and behold you have a new book here uh, rock critic law that i uh, 101 unbreakable rules for writing badly about music and it turns out i've been following the laws quite closely in my rock critic uh, life that's what i discovered by reading this book and i feel a bit sheepish about it but maybe uh, we can get to that oh i normally ask people where they are and i didn't do that where are you today actually i'm in uh, manhattan and you, in New York City. You lived there quite some time, right? Well, actually, I was born in Manhattan and uh, lived in the suburbs of New York and um, then came back here here for college and never left. Oh, you're a New Yorker through and through. I had no idea. That's 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 amazing. Now, New York, Manhattan, some something of a bastion for rock criticism. That's fair to say. Oh, sure. Uh, well, yeah, Rolling Stone. Uh, moved here in the whatever the, the seventies, I guess it was. That's right. And uh, and spin uh, is based here, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Sure, yeah. There's yeah, yeah, a lot of yeah. rock writing going on here. Village Voice, of course, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, it's a. Uh, it's uh, we don't have to big up New York. I don't think people know New York. <laughs> 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 I don't know why. I was like, this New York place sounds fascinating. I uh, <laughs> there seems to be a lot going on now. I know because I've read your book and I've read the introduction of your book. Why? You decided to write uh, Rock Critic Law, but for those who are unfamiliar with it, can we start there? Why did you decide, and as people don't know, you're a very esteemed uh, music critic, rock critic yourself, but what possessed you to to write this book? Well, thanks. You know, I, actually, I should preface my answer by saying I actually have done precious little criticism in my career. It's mostly journalism. Oh. And I'm, I, I'm just, I, I'm not sure even if that distinction is, is valid, but I, I generally write more feature stuff than, than record reviews. But that's that fair. aside. Totally fair. That's, that, that's yeah. an interesting distinction. I don't know that, I mean, there's several people like you who maybe just uh, do one or the other, but a lot of us tend to do a bit of both. Yeah. 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 That is very true. Yeah. 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 I had just started to notice well, actually, I'd been noticing for, you know, whatever it was, 30 years of reading about music, that certain phrases and metaphors and constructions just kept popping up. And I'd been meaning to sort of 
catalog them, you know, for many years. And I finally found a platform for that, and it's called Twitter. <laughs> yes. And uh, I just started posting some of the things that started occurring to me, like, um, you know, if two guitars play a melody line in harmony, then you must call that twin lead guitars. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I posted that, and I, and I added a hashtag that said Rock Critic Law. That's just the law. That's you have law. to do you this. You have to say that. That's correct. Otherwise, you get thrown in rock critic jail. And I started to accumulate them. Just more and more kept occurring to me. They just kept, you know, gushing out. <laughs> and after about, I don't know, 20 or 30 of these, people started responding and shipping in ones of their own and saying, oh, my gosh, I've done this, too. And this is hilarious. And you know, mostly it was colleagues and musicians. And they got to be pretty popular. And somewhere around that point, uh, a, a writer from the New York Observer, and as we've established, New York is a bastion of uh, a media. I don't know if you know that. Yeah, if people want to go to a place that's really cool, they should check out this New York place. It's great. Right. Lots, right, right. Of, lots lot, to see yeah. and do. Yeah. Yeah, lots of uh, TV stations and newspapers and yeah, things. Yeah, that's right. And this guy, Matthew Castle, emailed me and said, everyone loves your Rock Critic Law tweets. I'd like to do a piece about them. And would you do an interview? And I said, great. And um, as is my preference, I, I did the interview by email. And in the meantime, people had been starting to, to ask me, uh, hey, maybe you should do a book of these <laughs> things. And I just thought I'm not going to be one of those people who does a book of their tweets. Right. Nonetheless, I was thinking about how would one do a book of rock critic laws? <laughs> and I was kind of rolling it around in my mind. And at the end of this email interview, I just impulsively <laughs> said, by the way, there's a book in the works. And I just left it at that. Right. And, of course, the, the article comes out maybe a week later. And the headline is, Michael Azarad is doing a book of rock critic laws. And <laughs> I sent that to my agent. And he said, well, um, now you've got to do it. And we uh, we pitched it around to various publishers, and we got three offers. Wow! <laughs> much to my much to my uh, sort of shock and amazement, and we went with Harper Collins, the Day Street imprint of Harper Collins, and uh, we were off to the races. Yeah, no, I, I that, it's it's a fascinating sort of story that uh, your tweets came alive in this book, so to speak. Uh, and I, I I sheepishly said that I seem to have abided by some of these. Uh, rock critic laws, which are kind of inherently satirical. So I'm just fascinated by the fact that you had so many, you, you say that you started tweeting them, and musicians, I can understand musicians kind of having a laugh about them, but the, mm. the sensitive, thin-skinned rock music writer and critic aligning themselves with this project, I find fascinating. It, like, everyone who was from that world had a laugh about them too, probably, as you say, and like I said earlier, kind of admitting, oh man, I've I've said that or I've done that. What do you yeah. what do you suppose that means that that you offered this sort of release valve for <laughs> your your contemporaries and your peers to be like, oh man, I'm glad someone finally said this. I'm guilty of this. We have to do something <laughs> about this. Thank you. You know. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you know, there's uh, there's a lot of that. I think maybe going around in our society right now, people pointing out. Uh, systemic um bad behavior <laughs> yeah I'm on, and, <laughs> and being self-aware self-aware about it too yeah 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 and people coming forward and, and fessing up and you know and and mending their ways i think you know maybe uh the the current you know cultural climate is uh you know is very felicitous for this kind of yeah, stuff yeah maybe maybe rock maybe my book has tapped into the zeitgeist <laughs> <laughs> tapped into the zeitgeist that's a good one right there that's not necessarily <laughs> rock critic law but that's that's some kind of critic law i would say i i don't know which one it seems to that one might be a genre crosser if i might say uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a, a, a universal <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh, yeah. i'm curious why you might what you think of uh rock criticism in terms of why it might be more prone to such cliches than other genres of music criticism. In your intro, you say this, like you're, it's rock critic law. There's not, some of this other criticism is younger than rock criticism. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm talking about hip hop, uh, R&B, mm -hmm. newer musical forms. But why do you suppose, uh, is there, is that the only reason? Is it its age? Why do you suppose rock criticism is more prone 
to, to falling into these cliche traps. And also the sheep mentality that you mentioned too. This jargon emerges and then everyone to try to seem authoritative starts to use it because they read someone else use it. Common, that's common in, in journalism, I think. That's common in writing generally. Like, you know, we're, we, we are a little bit, always, even if we're trying to invent something, we're emulating someone somehow on some level. It's been done before. But again, rock criticism in particular, why would it be more prone to this wanton cliche mongering, I suppose? I think it's partially because rock critics are, and this is one of the, I think, one of the strengths and the weaknesses of the, the genre is that rock critics are amateurs. You know, usually little or no musical training, usually little little or no writing training. Mm-hmm. They just they just come into it with a, a passion for music and perhaps, a, you know, a, a big personality. There are many exceptions. I mean, there are many fine, fine writers. Sure. Uh, who, uh, but maybe the rank and file, which, of course, has swelled exponentially with the internet it is you know in in, in many ways unqualified mm. and i i you know and i don't i really hope i don't come off too elitist about this and i i really try to make sure that you know rock is a you know it's a very popular medium um and i think it it's it it should be crit- critiqued in a popular manner it can also be critiqued in other ways but it's totally valid to to, to critique it in a popular way. But I think that leads to some insecurity. I think a lot of writers just don't maybe have the chops or the knowledge to express themselves, you know, in an original way. Mm-hmm. Or uh, And I think also maybe they there's some insecurity there. And by using these, you know, to use a fancy $10 word, shibboleths, that they can be a member of the club, like, see, sure. I can use the lingo. Sure. And so that, that gets them into the rock critic club because they know to say, um, you know, dueling lead guitars when the, they're, the two guitars are alternating leads. As, as you're speaking there, I couldn't help but think that a lot of what you were saying about rock critics and rock criticism could be applicable to rock music itself. This is a, a music now that's is quite old. It's constantly, you know, as a new generation comes up, is it's constantly perpetuating its own cliches and i wonder if you think that writers are struggling to be original because the genre has certain conventions that have been circulating for so long huh, huh, that's that's a really interesting point um i mean certainly sure sure and you know the this idea of retromania was addressed you know uh brilliantly and uh at great length uh by my esteemed colleague simon reynolds mm-hmm in his book of the same name, and that is an absolutely uh, fascinating idea. And, I mean, there is certainly plenty of original rock music being made, but sure, it's a, you know, the, it's, you know, something like 60 years old now. But, but would you say when, when some original, when, when someone does something original with rock music, I feel like the writing about it is also elevated. I mean, I, I'm generalizing, of course. Uh, mm. There's going to be boilerplate criticism, but you, you know, you've been through it. Uh, I've been through it. You've seen a band or an artist kind of revolutionize not only the music, but there's the, a moment in time occurs, and they might be doing something along the lines of what other people have done, but they've just done it in a way that really captures people's uh, imaginations and attention. And I feel like rock critics... Uh, if they get swept up in that, I feel like they get excited and uh, and they write, uh, you know, in equal measure with with uh, maybe more verve. Uh, to, I hope that's not a rock critic cliche. Word. <laughs> now I'm very con- self conscious about all the words I use. You know, <laughs> well, you should be. And that's, I think that's, you know, that's the point of the book. You know, if you're a writer or you're you know you're speaking you know on a podcast or something like that, sure, you should you know you should come up with fresh language that, uh, you know, ex- expresses the matter at hand yeah. um, in a, you know, in your own idiosyncratic way. I think that's great. And that's part of the whole point of the book is to just, you know, write more carefully. Don't write in such a knee jerk fashion. Sure. Consider like try to write something that is appropriate to the, the, the moment that you're addressing and be original and true to yourself rather than, you know, kind of rubber stamping someone you know, this time tested <laughs> uh, language. But, you know, yes, some, I, I think original music can inspire really original writing, or it cannot. 
Yeah, I think this, my, the subtext of what I'm saying is maybe that there's boredom. I, I feel like people. I mean, you acknowledge a few things in the introduction. Like for people, for people who haven't seen this book yet, it's an the rock critic laws are presented uh, with an illustrated accompaniment, which we'll talk about uh, shortly. And it's pretty brief. You know, it's just here's the law, here's a little depiction of the law. But your introduction is is it's not long, but it's very explanatory. Like I, I really get where you're coming from with it. And within that, you suggest that rock music as an idiom is waning it's it's starting to become its own niche and and within the subtext of all of that i i gather that there's a bit of boredom uh between maybe among i don't want to say the musicians but maybe it just feels like everything has been said about rock music you know what i mean and and i feel like that's why people are repeating themselves whereas the other genres that you mention uh that that don't face this or, or you're they're too young to maybe scrutinize People are really stoked about them, you know. People are, they seem to be constantly reinventing themselves. Again, total generalization on some level, but I'm trying to spot a trend in what you've done here. Yeah, well, I, I don't know. I, you know, I don't, I gotta say, I don't read nearly as extensively in these other genres as much as I do in rock music, but hmm. I, I assure you there are standard, you know, phrases in electronic music criticism and hip hop criticism. Yeah. They're, I guarantee it. And, you know, maybe you could say that that those two genres also are starting to, you know, calcify. But I do think that that syndrome of, you know, the shibboleth, <laughs> the the, uh, the person who's not quite sure they belong in this club pontificating, you know, on a pedestal about this music, they want to make sure that they sound like they belong. So they use the lingo. Yeah. And I mean, again, I think it speaks to a little bit of the practice, too. Like how many sort of adjectives or synonyms can you really invoke when people have guitar bass and drums and a voice you know at some point i had a friend who thinks we should just start over with band names there should be a new acdc it's just like let's just start over <laughs> reset <laughs> because there are there's too many like bad band names and there's too many bad it's i i don't know i'm not saying everyone's bored i i, I maybe i did say that but there does that does seem to be like part of what's going on is that people just don't know what They've seen it all, and and when people are doing things with conventional instrumentation, and it's happening with hip hop too. Like everyone is getting used to the fact that there's likely going to be two turntables, microphones, that kind of stuff, and eventually, it you would acknowledge, I would think, Michael, it can be difficult to come up with a fresh way of talking about something when there's a convention in place. Yes, although I, you know, people periodically do you know upset the convention. You know, for for years in hip hop, there was Run DMC and. LL Cool J in that model, and then all of a sudden, Public Enemy comes up, right? And and it's still that was, in a way, that was still two turntables and some microphones, yeah. And you know, and later on comes uh, NWA, et cetera, et cetera, on and on. You know, there are still fresh, uh, you know, wrinkles to be had in music. You know, and rock music. You know, my sort of go-to for originality is Dirty Projectors, right? Right. I, uh, that's that's really original music. And, uh, you know, you can still do some new things, uh, even with those, you know, those kind of very basic setups. So, so, to, so it, to speak it's to, possible. Yeah, I, I agree with you. So to, to speak to my earlier contention, did you read Rock Criticism of the Dirty Projectors and think, oh, someone was turned on by this and it, it elevated their, their skill set as well as a critic? Um, sometimes, but <laughs> often, but, but I think, it, yeah, but sometimes, but. Often not, you know. I, I've read some just really terrible, sloppy writing about dirty projectors that that almost made me write a letter to the editor. I mean, it was just, <laughs> just so just yeah, terrible. It's yeah, con it's confusing. I think on some level, when someone innovates like a band like that one does, mm. it's in almost indescribable, which you acknowledge too. It's very difficult to write, uh, you know, about music. It is. It can be. Um, and and yet at the same time, if they that same band might elicit someone to fall into the convention or cliche trap because they don't know what it is, you know, and they, they go to something familiar. Anyway, I'm all right. over, I'm all over the place with it. And, uh, because I, this is, this has intrigued me, your rock critic law thing. It's touched me on some level. It's affected me. Well, uh, uh <laughs> great, great. Thank you. I'm very flattered. Yeah. It's funny. I, I, you know, I was just accumulating these things. And by the way, by the time the uh, that book offer came in, I only had fifty, and I had vowed <laughs> to do to do a hundred and one because you know that's the kind of a hundred and one. That's like 
that's how many you do for these things. 101 limericks, you know, 101 Dalmatians? You know, riddles or whatever. Dal- Dalmatians? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah 101 Dalmatians, yeah, sure. sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's always 101. And I, for a minute, I was really worried. Am I going to be able to get you 101 from about 50? And it was actually no problem. There's tons of these things. <laughs> well, uh, you and I are Facebook friends, and I saw that you uh, these would pop up as both tweets and Facebook posts. And then, yeah, right. of course, you would get, particularly I think on Facebook, you would get a ton of comments and posts back. And I assume those inspired you in, in, in different ways as well. Yeah. Oh, I, and I should add, though, I, I just started accumulating these things. And when I, I, I had to write an introduction, and so I had to... Now I had to figure out what does it all mean. Yeah, and uh, you know that's kind of what we've been talking about yeah. so far in this yeah. conversation. Yeah. But I, at first, I had I, I, all I was doing was accumulating these things, and and I had to figure out what was the significance of this. And it turns out there kind of is, and that that's that's what I keep coming back to is you know write more carefully, but also read more carefully when you come across these things. You know maybe you should say wow tut tut that's um, that's kind of weak. You know, they could have tried harder. Yeah, there's an interesting and, moment in your introduction where a colleague of yours suggests that the best way to become a better rock critic and keep your, your lingo fresh and all those sorts of things is to not read, uh, simply, not to only read rock criticism, read fiction, read poetry, read other things to kind of, yeah. you know, keep your mind sort of sharp. Uh, and I think that's really good advice. And uh, I will say that's something I try to do. Uh, I don't want to make this all about me. I don't feel like this book is for me and directed at me. Cause, uh, <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> actually, um, I, I, I don't know how to break this to you. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been uh, following all the laws. There are just a few where I'm like, I've totally used moniker when I use band name or whatever, you know, like I just, yeah. syn- a lot of it's synonyms, you know, I'm like, ah, I, when I ask my wife to look over something, I often will be like, and keep an eye out if I if I repeat words too much, uh, you know, like mm. if I say the name over and over again or the title, why don't I just slip in a quick moniker, you know? And that's uh, that's one of the <laughs> the laws. You must use the word moniker, even though you would never say that word out loud. That's true. I would never say, "Hey, what's your moniker?" I uh, hi, I, <laughs> I'm Vish. I didn't catch your moniker. I would never say that. That's a weird. Yeah. You're right. It's a language usage thing. But we want to seem smart, uh, and, and that's all it is. I guess that's what it is, partially. Now, I've mentioned one of uh, the laws there. I don't want to put you on the spot. Mm. I have a few highlights that I wanted to ask you a little bit about. But do, sure. you, do you have particular uh, favorites of the laws that you want to cite uh, right now? Do, is there anything that comes to mind? Wow. Um, there are 101. Well, I know there are 101. I just wonder if anything comes to mind. Yeah, uh, you know, well, you know, they're they're all my children. <laughs> uh, uh, I would yeah. say I would say they reward repeat listens. How about that? That's one of them. That's one that just came to mind. I just flipped open the book. Uh, uh, if, if you know you're supposed to like the album but didn't get it at at first, you must say it re- rewards repeat listens. That's a inherently self conscious thing that a writer might do. I don't get this, but everyone's got it, so I'm going to say it grows on you. Uh, right. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. It grew on me because I was on a deadline, and uh, it was 3 in the morning, and I had to say something. Uh, <laughs> that happens <laughs> well, to the best of I, us. Yes, I think that's part of it also. Frankly, you just hit on something also. Yeah. Another reason why people come up with this stuff is because they're jammed for time. Yeah. You know, maybe... It, and. Uh, Writing about music pays even less than it ever did for most people. And consequently, you have to jam out a lot of words quickly if you want to make anything that vaguely resembles a living. Yeah. And and so you, you often people, I think, are often forced to write not nearly as well or as journalistically soundly yeah. as they would like because they simply don't have the time. Or maybe they're just burnt out or fried. And also, I think the editor might also be overworked and fried and can't nip those things in the bud. So that's that's another factor. Um, yeah, I think uh, that I should really make clear. Yeah, I think when you're stressed in any way, and you mentioned a few causes of stress there that a writer might endure, your mind is tired. That's what I've learned as I've gotten older. Is that uh, I co- I consider myself a night owl, but uh, doctors and various people have told me. 
you should probably get some more sleep uh, and and relax a little. You know, you're always up against deadlines. You're always working towards something. Take a break. Uh, and I think that as because of our the nature of our work, uh, some of our hours, because the rock shows happen late at night, and then maybe we have to write about them when we get home. Uh, yep. I think that's a factor here. Honestly, I think it's a physiological thing. We're just we run out of words because our minds aren't working as well as they should. So my advice to all rockers and rock critics is uh, go to bed earlier. Get some sleep for crying out loud. <laughs> Your mind will thank you for it later. Because there's a here's one that I like, uh, and I, I know I know I put you on the spot. I'm just going to cite a couple I like. If you think of anything, let me know. But sure. th- this is one that comes to mind. All fan bases are either devoted, dedicated. Or loyal. Now that is, I've seen that. I've I've used that. I'm pretty sure one of them. And th- these are ostensibly synonyms. These are things that people use to t- talk about fan bases. Why do you suppose we we want to describe fan? Isn't it the fan base inherently going to be those things? I don't. Why do we do this? <laughs> <laughs> because it's just a, it's a stock phrase. You've yeah. seen it a million times, and yeah. you just regurgitate it. You know, like a like a macro. You know, it's just sort of like a, a preset little nugget of of syllables that you just spit out without really thinking about it yeah and that yeah again i keep coming back to that and you know instead of not thinking about it think about it yeah that's true and 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 the club aspect or the clique aspect comes through in a couple of these like this is a this one i I spoke to me you are prohibited from saying anything bad about the following michael (laughs) jackson the beatles the ramones wu-tang clan bjork radiohead taylor swift talking heads fugazi and abba Canon. So basically, things get canonized, and and then mm. that's it. You can't do anything. That's a weird thing. Like it's a taste. Everyone's got their own taste. I I don't even like all of those bands. I'll say that right now. I don't care for all of those people. Now I'm gonna get. Oh, I'm gonna get in trouble. Oh wow. Uh, you know. Uh, listen. Uh, I have to run. <laughs> Uh, I don't know where all the time went. Uh, are those sirens I hear? Am I going to <laughs> to, to jail anyway? Yeah, it's, yeah. Rock critic jail. Yeah, it's bad. um. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, there, there's a canon, too. And yes, and that is part of the, the club aspect, I think, partially, too. You yeah. can't you can't be heretical. I, you know, you like I say, these I have 101 of them. Yeah. Each one of them are my children. But I, you know, I'm I, I'm often a stickler for, you know, knowing what the words mean. <laughs> and uh, right, right now, one of them, one of my favorites is gnomic doesn't mean like a gnome, but that doesn't matter. Use it like. Use it like that anyway. <laughs> yeah, <there's> and a... <laughs> partially, part of the reason I actually love that is because of the illustration that um, Ed Fotheringham came up with for that. But that there's a few of those where you know um, in the book where uh, people often just simply don't know what the word means. Like they'll often I'll see someone say ephemeral when they mean ethereal, or vice versa. Yes, you know that again. That's sort of unthinking. That means they never actually looked up the word. They just saw it somewhere and are repeating it. Well, there's a. I was once in the last year. I, I posted some review I'd written on Twitter, and someone wrote to say thanks for the, the. That was a cool review, and thanks for properly saying homing in on instead of honing in on. Yes. And I was like, okay, okay. like I, I didn't even think twice about it. But you, that is one that you, I believe, in my version of the book, it's. Let's yep. see here. It's page forty-six in my version of this. I have a galley, so don't take my don't quote me on the uh, page no. number. But uh, yeah, by all means, say honing in on and not homing in on because words no longer have meaning. Little jab at the end of the rock critic law. <laughs> little lang- yeah. little language snob thing at the end, but it's true. We we are losing. Do you think the Twitter is uh is working against us that way? Like people are just ex- and and of course you know we're in a truth isn't always truth era too i feel like intellect and stuff this that's swimming around in your book too like the kind mm-hmm. of everything's kind of like we don't take our intelligence and smarts as seriously as maybe we should uh yes and to quote a, a great simpsons line uh you know what i blame this on the breakdown of society <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah we're just saying whatever we're saying yeah no that's a a major part of this book too so i i mean in conclusion i suppose actually before i get to the conclusion which is uh kind of a what do you want uh, critics and other people to take away from this book i, I gave you a sneak peek at my sort of concluding <laughs> question but i do want to ask about uh, your illustrator here and and how this collaboration worked and i didn't want to forget to do that because that's a key 
aspect of this book. Can you speak to that? Sure. Uh, well, the the first time I ever went to Seattle was to write a, a Rolling Stone article about the Seattle scene and, and also at the same, in the same issue, uh, a cover story about Nirvana. And that was the one uh, that had the cover story of, um, and, and Kurt was wearing a t-shirt that said, corporate magazines still suck. That's correct, yep. And, big, big uh, issue, big issue for me. By the way, I have that okay. issue somewhere in my parents' house still. That made oh, it. Wow. That made it sound less special. I have that yeah. issue in storage at my parents' house. <laughs> but I <laughs> no, remember, you thought <laughs> you, you thought to keep it. That's very funny. I kept. Uh, I kept uh, all my Nirvana, Rolling Stone uh, magazines, and uh, yeah, for sure, and uh, many other Rolling Stone magazines. I suppose are somewhere in my parents' house. But yeah, I was probably fifteen, I guess, when that. When I read that, uh, so yeah, it was a big deal for me. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, anyway, sorry. It, yeah. It, it was a it was a big deal for me. Too. <laughs> it's been a life changing <laughs> event for you too. Yes, I assume that's Absolutely. fair to say. Yeah. 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 And so I I uh, flew out to Seattle, was taken directly to a party <laughs> by uh, a guy named Nils Bernstein, who was then the, the uh, publicist for Sub Pop, and I was taken directly to a party thrown by this guy Ed Fotheringham, who was kind of you know Seattle scenester. He uh, sang in a, in a band called The Throne Ups, mm -hmm. whose uh, hit song, as far as I'm concerned, was titled Eat My Dump. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a, a lot of the grunge musicians were there at this party. It was totally happening. And it was, wow, I thought, you know, I was immediately just blown away by the community feeling yeah. like, wow, it's like, look, there's that guy from that band and that guy from that band. They're all at this party. They're all together. That was a revelation in itself. But... I made friends with this guy, Ed Fotheringham, um, who, like I say, sang in this band, but also did some illustrations for Mud Honey mm -hmm. and bands like Flop and uh, various other, you know, kind of then kind of low level bands, except for Mud Honey, around Seattle. Yeah. And we made friends and kind of just stayed in touch ever since. And this is 1992. And over there, it's just kind of vaguely stayed in touch. We're acquainted, would bump into each other every now and then, every few years. And this book started to happen and I realized I needed illustrations and I dropped him a line. And in the meantime, of course, he'd become this very famous illustrator. He does stuff for the New Yorker, Vanity Fair, the Atlantic, he did a great series of things for Verve records. Mm -hmm. He's, you know, he's really a top illustrator. Yeah. So I, I, I worked up the nerve to drop him a line and say, Ed, how would you like to do illustrations for this book? And, and he said, how many? And I said, uh, you know, I gulped hard basically and said 101 <laughs> <laughs> and, and he banged them out oh, and wow. he did it really brilliantly. And there were a lot of, a lot of them that I just had no idea how he was going to illustrate them. And he came up with great solutions and it's, it was really an interesting, you know, lesson in illustration, not just because they look great, but because he really has a great mind and he really came up with, you know, solutions to these problems of how to illustrate these things so it was really cool was it as simple uh, not as simple obviously you say he banged them out did you simply send him all 101 laws and then he took to him or were, were you was there were there conversations about how certain things would be depicted well i sent them all to him i had and i i sent him a spreadsheet and i had some time some ideas like there's one about uh something about how uh, if one punk band sells out then you must say that punk as a genre is dead. Mm -hmm. And I said, I really want like a, a punk lying on the ground with X's on his eyes. <laughs> you know, so he, I think he basically did that. But there are others that I just said, I have no idea. Right. And just, you know, uh, come up with something. <laughs> yeah. And he would come up with these, like say, solutions to these problems. You know, that's the way I thought of them. Mm -hmm. And he solved them. And he's, he's really great. Uh, you know, he's, there's, there's a reason why he's at the top of his profession. He's really, really smart guy. Yeah. So, well, it, yeah, it, it really, uh, I, I was trying, uh, as I was reading the book and I was looking at the illustrations, it occurred to me like, I don't know how else you would have done this book, uh, frankly, without these little, uh, illustrations to kind of, you know, convey the idea more fully. Like, I, I just, when when I heard you were doing this book, I didn't know about the illustrations part of it. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I thought, well, that's going to be interesting just a, <laughs> a a law a page but no it really really works well together and like i say it has uh given me a lot of things to think about and uh so on uh, from a 
from one rock writer or critic. Uh, I hope uh, uh, that means something to you. Uh, have you gotten? You mentioned that there was a, a great response to the tweets, and and I mentioned the Facebook posts as well. Have you gotten feedback uh, about the book from anyone who's uh, had a chance to look at it? Uh, did you send it to any rock critics to be like, what do you think? You know. Oh, um, uh, well, I, I didn't send it out. The, you know, the, of course, the publisher yeah. does that. And I've gotten, yeah, I've gotten some great feedback. But most of it is, you know, the mea culpa thing. <laughs> uh, like, oh, wow, I've done so many of these. This is awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. You know, it's that funny combination of, you know, yeah, mea culpa and, and this is awesome. I, I, and I, I don't mean to oversell this, but I do think that because no one has really, really pointed this out, as far as I can recall, this right. will, I think, among rock critics and, and music writers, uh, if they pick up this book, I hope that it will keep make them mindful of these things. Is that? Is, uh, do you have any hopes and dreams about what you what this book might do for rock criticism if it's uh, circulated? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I mean, I. I I'm, that would be really, really nice. And, and I hope it does, you know, make an impact on some people. I hope I hope mostly that people just get a chuckle of recognition out of it. I actually have had a couple of people say that they want to use it in courses. Yes, yes. Exactly. Uh, like writing, yeah. you know, journalism and writing courses. And um, I have a publicist friend who teaches uh, music publicity at uh, a university in Oregon who, who wants to use it in her class, um, you know, because a lot of that writing does wind up in bios and promotional stuff too so uh you know it, it, it's i am getting that feedback and it, it and I, I you know i know it's making fun and sometimes it could be quite snarky but i think you know it's it it is the book was done with a lot of love and i do hope it actually does have a constructive effect on on the world <laughs> well I, I it's very funny but it's very true it's funny because it's true it's true because right. it's funny whatever you want to say I uh, I think you are, uh, if this helps you with your day at all, I feel like every book that I've read of yours uh, now has the, if the ones I've read already, I feel like kind of changed things, uh, not for me only, but I can, you talk to people about your books and your work and it's altered people in some significant way. This is another one of those books, I think. This is a book that's going to, uh, this is change we can believe in. In a yeah. <laughs> rock critic law book, I hope uh, I hope that resonates with you on some level. I think that's going to be the case. I, and it sounds like you're already if you're hearing from actual, you know, yeah. teachers and stuff. That's this mm -hmm. is going to resonate. So I, I thank yeah. you, Michael, for this book. And it has been a, a while since I think some of us have heard from you. What are you are you working on other things? What have you been up to? Well, uh, actually, another thing that I'm up to is uh, uh, mining the legacy. <laughs> Um, right now, I'm casting the audiobook version of Our Band Could Be Your Life. Oh, excellent. And, yeah, I, I'm reading the introduction and the, the epilogue, which I actually did just yesterday. And we're having guest readers, uh, people who were influenced by the bands in the book, reading a corresponding chapter. So uh, it's just starting, but Jeff Tweedy from Wilco is going to read the Minutemen chapter. Oh, nice. And Meryl Garbus from Toon Yards is going to read Sonic Youth. Wow. Okay. So you've got actual musicians and, and uh, c c celebrities and whatnot reading these chapters. That's great. Yeah. Fred Armisen reading Butthole Surfers. And yeah, got got a few more uh, coming about to be announced. So uh, yeah, so that's, you know, that's actually more work than it seems <laughs> inviting people and, you know, it's kind of just coordinating all that stuff. And there's also going to be an audio book of Come As You Are, The Story of Nirvana. Hmm. Uh, I, I will probably, again, read the introduction and the epilogue to that and have a, a guest reader, uh, someone with you know some relevance to Nirvana, uh, to read the actual book. Uh, uh, okay. But that, that's a little bit down the line. But yeah, and then after that, you know, this whole experience with Rock Critic Law has made me think, uh, I would love to be an editor <laughs> I would love to, I, and I've done that. I, I was the editor of eMusic for, I don't know, what was it, four years. And then I was the editor of the Talk House for yeah. something like three years. And I really, really enjoy editing. I love working with writers. Uh, I got, frankly, so much great feedback from, especially from the Talk House. People would say, I was so anxious about writing and, and you helped me come up with something really great. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful experience. And that was so gratifying, and I would love to do that so much more. Excellent. I would love to be an editor. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. 
behind the scenes stuff, I suppose, is the way to put it, but very, very integral behind the scenes stuff. Yeah. I, and I, I, I want to, I definitely want to write more books, but I find editing so fulfilling. Yeah. I, I did that with Bob Mould for his book and that was really a gratifying experience. And I want to just, I want to do that a lot more. Nice. Well, it's, it's yeah. great to hear you, uh, feeling, uh, uh, fulfilled and, and 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 working so vibrantly and uh, uh where can people go to learn more about about you i suppose and also this book rock critic law do you have places you can send them in the in the in the internet i suppose <laughs> uh yeah well you know uh i gotta i gotta say my i think my wikipedia i haven't looked at it in a while but i think my wikipedia <laughs> page is pretty comprehensive oh, okay and then uh and then the harper collins uh site has a page about rock critic law and you can read more about that and maybe see some illustrations and things like that. So there's, you know, a, there's that. There's a Twitter feed, right? Rock Critic Law? Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Although um, on the occasion of uh, uh, the publication of the book, I had to delete a whole bunch of them so as not to give away the show. Oh, of course. Right. Of course. But you yeah. will start. Uh, but uh, yeah, th- that's still an active uh twitter feed but you probably won't read rock critic laws you'll just read news about the book and, right okay and other stuff yeah. yeah and what about you on twitter i'm on twitter yeah michael uh, michael azaret all one word i it's funny in, in terms of social media i on twitter i only tweet positive things about music <laughs> i i just i want to be just on the positive chip yes there's no reason to to rip on anything right. uh there's too much to rip on there's so much deserving stuff that needs to be celebrated so you know, um, yeah, on Twitter, that's that's what I do. Okay, well, yeah, people should follow you there. And again, the new book is Rock Critic Law, 101 Unbreakable Rules for Writing Badly About uh, Music. Michael, it's uh, always nice to talk to you. I hope we do it before another 10 years goes by. But I, I do want to <laughs> thank you for being on my show, and, and I wish you the best of luck with this book and, and all future endeavors. Thank you, Vish, for such a wonderful, smart interview. Special thanks again to my colleague, Michael Azarad, for being on this, the 436th episode of Creative Control, which is part of the Entertainment One podcast network and is available on all iOS and Android platforms and also on things like Spotify, YouTube, and Audio Boom as well. If you can't find an episode that you're looking for or if you wish to learn more about me and sign up for my regularly scheduled newsletter, please visit my website, vishkana.com. You can like Creative Control on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter at vishcreative. You can follow me directly on Twitter at Vishkana. You can also listen to a radio show version of Creative Control on Wednesdays at noon Eastern Standard Time around the world at CFRU.ca. You can stream it right there. Or if you're, you know, if you want, you can listen to it on an actual radio at 93.3 FM if you're in or near Guelph. Also, please visit patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly pledge to keep this podcast running it relies almost exclusively upon your pledges to generate any revenue at all of any kind so please patreon.com slash creative control if you like the show would like to support it with a uh, you know um, it could be anything it could be a dollar could be five dollars could be could could be ten thousand dollars a month or or more whatever you like patreon.com and you can change you can also if you're like ah 10 seems high for this crap i'm gonna go back i'm gonna go down to nine thousand dollars a month you can do that at any time it's flexible donations you can change it it's fine patreon.com slash creative control thanks again to uh, pizza trocadero the bookshelf planet bean coffee and granddad's donuts for their in-kind support for this show and uh, thanks as always to my friend jim guthrie for letting me use some music from uh, his world his his creations uh, I, I get to use the rest is yet to come in particular to end the show each week and you can learn more about jim at jimguthrie.org and finally uh, thank you very much for listening to this show you mean a lot to me and I- I'm glad that I mean something to you uh, that you've uh, continued to subscribe to this podcast and tell your friends about it and, and spread the word about it it really means a lot and I-, I-, I thank you I just wanted to say thanks and that's it I will talk to you very very soon I hope you're well and I hope you keep well and I hope everything goes well for you bye for now <laughs>